Welcome, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's BC Echo session for post COVID 19 recovery. Today's topic is persistent disability programs and required forms. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jill Calder, our presenter today. Dr. Calder graduated with dual qualifications in physical therapy and occupational therapy at UBC in 1982. She received her MD at Queens in 1986 and a physical medicine and rehabilitation fellowship at Dalhousie in 1991. She's been participating in developing rehabilitation services in Kamloops for inpatient, outpatient, and regional service. Special contributions include development of electromyography, telerehab, autism, and developmental pediatric treatments, and ALS out outreach services. For various community advocacy projects, Dr. Calder received the Doctors of BC Silver Medal of Service in, 19, in 2018. COVID-19 has provided an opportunity for her to reevaluate priorities, pivot service developments, and collaborate in novel, novel ways. Much of the upfront attention to this pandemic has been in the acute phase, but has become clear that there are now patients requiring a multidisciplinary medical and rehabilitation approach. Welcome, Dr. Calder. I'd like to remind you that for UBC CPD accreditation, that we'll be keeping track in the chat. So if you can put your first name, last name, along with your email address, we'll be able to track you. And a reminder to use the raise hand function if you have any questions. Welcome, everybody. I'll start. Thanks for that um, introduction. You may notice that there are two Dr. Jill Calders. This is my first time to present from home. And I want to assure you that I locked my bedroom door and have blurred the background so you don't have to see my mess. I have two phones, my, my phone on the go to help out to make sure my share screen is going well. Um, so that's why there's a, a second Dr. Calder. I'm going to share my screen, but I also want to use the presenter view from home, which is a little new for me to try. And I'm hoping that we go off without a glitch here. And... Okay, so you should be seeing the full presentation and I get to have my notes, which is helpful for me to stay on track and on time. Why did you all sign up for this wonderful topic, which is quite a pain actually, forms and uh, getting people into the right support services. It's a, a very big challenging area. So I hope to uh, take one hour of your time today and make it really worthwhile. The post-COVID support for disability programs and required forms is our focus for today. I don't have any conflicts of interest for this particular topic. I did get a bit of a grant when I was um, presenting on post-COVID recovery and rehabilitation back in April, and that was a CMA grant. I acknowledge that I am privileged to live, work, and play within the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Shwetmagulu, uh, the Shwetmakte Tecumlicks, uh, and as well the Twin Rivers Metis group. I'd like to specially thank uh, the planning team and the Echo Hub Committee for contributions to getting this talk off the ground, especially Dr. Arsenault's extra uh, contributions around tax credit section and Shelley Petrula around the PWD section. And the Echo Hub Committee that's working very hard in the background to make this pull off is really uh, something that I've enjoyed collaborating with this group. The learning objectives are that you will become familiar with residual symptoms in the patients with a post COVID, the ability to uh, document their functional impacts and to be able to approach the disability terms, documentation forms and systems with less uh, stress and to understand that there are different systems, uh, WCB, CPB, uh, PWD, mortgage and all sorts of third party payers that we often get a form thrown at us to try and fill out. This uh, talk actually pays homage to my father, Dr. Tom Calder. He practiced on the North Shore in West Vancouver for 47 years from 1953 to the year 2000. He retired in the year 2000 saying, these hands have saved lives, but they've never touched a keyboard. And he was a very happy uh, full service uh, general uh, family physician. And this cartoon was drawn for him by my husband, Bob Walter as a way to personalize his retirement note to his patients. 
And what it shows is him playing his music man interest behind the medicine man pile of charts that were always due with a coffee cup precariously perched on top. This really did capture my father's uh, hate for paperwork, love for music and love for his patients. He always said it's much easier to deal with the live patient than to do the paperwork after you've seen them. To remind you of post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, now called PASC or post-COVID as I'll keep referring to it to, there's a real spectrum. And I had Bob draw me an umbrella of, for the umbrella of conditions that will likely continue to evolve as we learn more about the virus and its effects. Uh, the patients that have had a long stay in ICU, permanent organ damage of lungs or heart, they're a little bit easier to document as a family physician because they will have had a bunch of documentation and potentially participation in full stream rehab. For the post-intensive care syndrome patients with muscle uh, weakness, nerve uh, conditions, uh, post-ICU, that is also another entity that's being picked up. I think the challenging category are the post-viral fatigue syndrome patients and patients with a myriad of, of symptoms that we're still trying to kind of categorize in that long-term COVID-19 category. And these really are the ones that we'll focus on today. So to remind you of that first uh, exposure and then one week or two to four weeks, we would call them a PCR positive acute COVID case. That is where the post-COVID clinics are focusing. But by week uh, four to 12, they're in that acute still recovering phase. And we start to call them post-COVID if they have symptoms persisting past week 12. And this uh, slide is from the uh, Nature's Medicine uh, submission, April, March, April of this year. It's really nice visual and a very good summary at that point in time. So I bring to your attention some of the options of, um, of uh, how this affects us. And uh, I wanted to be able to point out that this category of fatigue, decline in quality of life, muscular pain, joint pain, post-exertional malaise and fatigue are a bigger category that a family physician will be uh, dealing with. The ones that have a longer term lung and uh, heart uh, conditions will often have internist, mental, uh, uh, um, uh, respirologist or cardiologist following them. The other catch bag that's very hard are the patients that have an escalation of anxiety, depression, uh, and cognitive disturbances, the cognitive brain fog category. And those two are really where a lot of forms are more challenging to fill out and where I will focus today. Many who have gone through the rehab system will have flowed to you with documentation of the acute phase, subacute phase, a short stay rehab or an outpatient program. And I have a talk uh, that I did back in April that was all around how we were already squeezed for our regular rehab and this uh, avalanche occurred of having to uh, deal with uh, patients who are COVID positive in amongst the regular population. So big challenges. But I did have a little bit of a problem when I was listening to the news between March and June of last year and by the summer of last year in 2020, when Bonnie Henry would say we have so many new cases, so many in bed, so many in ICU, and she would often end with and so so recovered. And the word recovered kind of bothered me. Uh, having dealt with post polio sequelae, I kind of went, are we really recovered? And sure enough, by the summer or September of last year, the catch bag of post COVID-19 was starting to become clear. So I stopped using the word recovered. And I think we then had to deal with the issue of trying to maximize medical improvement. And we really still don't know where we're at in terms of full recovery. And some patients get quite stuck with a number of symptoms that are very debilitating. So I wanted to recategorize those weeks of zero to four weeks being acute, four to 12 post-acute. By 12 to 24, we start calling them PASC or post-COVID. Over six months, they definitely are in that category. And then this outer range of when to stop calling them post-COVID and start calling them a new condition of, of chronic fatigue syndrome, 18 months has been bandied, bandied about. And we really don't know whether these patients are going to have permanent sequelae. It's still a work in progress with the data and our experience. But as we go through this, the acute medical phase um, is that there's a lot of private party things that patients will have bought into. So Manulife, Sun Life, Blue Cross, Great West Life. And some of them will have zero to four week or zero to 12 week coverage of their time off work. And so we're put in a position of filling out those kinds of forms. 
when they move into the acute and post-acute, a lot of them will be in the category of short-term disability. And short-term, the patients like that, short as in I'm gonna get better, but sometimes the flip point at 24 weeks catches them off guard and they will be redefined uh, as a longer term disability by whatever program they are under. And some payer, payers have that at six, 12 or 24 months. So it can be a bit of a shock to the patient when someone starts calling them long or permanent and that's scary to them. And we don't, really don't know if they are long or permanent but we do need to support them as they're going through their post COVID journey. Uh, WorkSafe BC has its system, which you may be familiar with by other claimants that have gone through. The issue with WorkSafe is they had to catch up with post-exertional malaise and fatigue, which uh, we want to uh, be careful about prescribing activation. And a lot of WorkSafe BC programs are based on work conditioning and work hardening principles. I think they have improved lately, but sometimes you have to write a support note for that. Disability tax credit kicks in about six months and with uh, symptoms that should be considered persistent for at least uh, 12 months. And there's a number of gradations and uh, longer term supports that a patient can get into. Very few are being paid out as pensions and one needs to look at the best support system for each patient on an individual basis. If you wish to retrace the literature that I've drawn from to summarize uh, post-acute COVID symptoms, I did do a talk, there is a YouTube of it, and the PowerPoint slides have uh, been, been loaded up. I think that the actual link to this is on the PHSA website as well, and it is up to date as of April the 20th, but things keep moving in COVID, so bear in mind that some things would need to be revised. But the biggest sort of literature moment for me was by January 16th. China, Huang and et al. finally had enough N to impress me that these six month follow-up symptoms uh, were potentially a persistent pattern. And there have been other better and more uh, bigger N studies since uh, January, but this one was nicely laid out. With these symptoms as you run your eye down, fairly wide far-flung symptoms that the patients can be complaining of. One to 2% actually of that 1700 were so activity impaired that they were unable to do even their basic activities of daily living. So this was a bit of a uh, opening of my mind. How to approach this? Yeah, you're already equipped as family physicians uh, being generalists to do a general review of systems. I remember in medical school, we brushed, I brushed this off and I said, okay, from head to toe, COVID seems to be affecting things. So I kind of went back to the review of systems and wrote it back out again. For vision, not a lot, nothing with the retina or optic nerve that I know about. But hearing is a complaint, tinnitus or a sense of ear fullness. They really complain of that. And yet to see or to test, sometimes nothing that we can tap down. Smell, everybody's heard about smell and taste being affected in 10 to 15% of patients and being a bit more debilitating than I think we've given it credit for because uh, keeping your food and nutrition up is so important. The respiratory system, the usual questions of shortness of breath, or sopnea, O2 dependence longer term. For the cardio system, shortness of breath on exertion, a sense of chest pain or chest awareness, tachycardia, hypotension, and the full on uh, POTS, postural orthostatic tachypneic syndrome. Uh, some of those patients will express that, sometimes being misunderstood as anxiety or an anxiety reaction. The GI system is a bit vague, uh, just a sense of GI upset, uh, dyspepsia, uh, uh, an appetite being down. Sometimes if they have a nausea, a and nausea uh, upset stomach, they're not going to do well for their oral intake. There's no incontinence or bowel or bladder symptoms with COVID that I've heard of yet. Neuro symptoms are a little bit far flung, including pain, numbness, weakness, but that postural insecurity can kind of be part of the hypotension. And musculoskeletally very involved, muscle pain, muscle fatigue, a sense of being un unable to participate without the rebound post-exertional malaise. And cognitively, these patients are very interesting. The brain fog that everybody's happy to call it is, is a, a sense of reduced attention, the inability to memorize new information, a confusion as that starts to set in. And if trying to do uh, uh, cognitive activities, a sense of cognitive fatigue. Um, anxiety, depression, and distress are the affective disorders. If not already present, they get amplified. 
I wanted to touch base on terminology that sometimes is a bit uncomfortable because the English language keeps changing what's acceptable to say. So at the patient level, we take a history for symptoms. We try to categorize it as a disease. And once we get a disease in our heads, we often will say, these are the common impairments of joint range strength, uh, gait tolerance, uh, uh, activities of daily living. That's the impairment level. But at the human level, we uh, describe uh, the limitation in the old terms under the WHO, it was actually called a disability. And sometimes these are still used interchangeably depending on which payer you're working with. The more acceptable tune by 1997 was activity limitation, and most people just call it limitations. And it is defined as any restriction or lack resulting from an impairment of an ability to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. So that would me be me putting on my socks, I actually have a limitation. I can't reach my feet sometimes, I'm very stiff. But that is a, a personal disability or limitation based on osteoarthritis of the back or hip. At the social level, we used to call it handicap. But at the social level is if I'm in a wheelchair and trying to get into a building, I don't really have a handicap if they've ramped the building, have wide doorways, and a wheelchair accessible bathroom for me. So this is a social level of understanding the, um, the um, patient's uh, impact of their disability and limitation onto the things that they want to do. So a, a restriction is any disadvantage for a given individual resulting from the impairment or limitation that limits or prevents the fulfillment of a role that is normal, depending on their age, sex, and social and cultural factors for that individual. So if I want to uh, be running a marathon and I have significant OA knee, that is not going to be something that I can do. I'm handicapped from marathons, but not from stairs and reaching my feet most days. The other things to ask about when you assess a person, I think I double jumped there. Um, we can take them through a day in their life as a way to kind of get a functional. You could also get them to do this as a, a checklist in the waiting room while you're waiting to see them, or you can mail it out ahead of the appointment that you're having by Zoom and ask them basic questions of their function. Uh, I usually start to ask the series of, oh, you get up, you're sleeping in a regular bed. You have to prop it up. Are you able to move in bed? Can you sit up at the edge of the bed in the morning to get up and go? Can you get up and go without touching or pulling on anything? Or are you able to are, are you able to navigate your way to the bathroom? Can, can you get on and off the toilet? Can you groom and stand to groom your face? Can you get in and out of the shower? Um, are you able to walk any distance up or downstairs? Or upstairs easy, downstairs not? And do you use any devices? Cane, crutch, walk, or wheelchair? Uh, when you have your breakfast, did you make it? Are you able to make a meal? Are you able to make a snack? Are you able to shop for the food that you made that snack out of? And who does your housework and clean up of the kitchen? And as you take them through the rest of the day, you can say, well, what do you do in a day? Oh, you're working from home or you're not. Are you paying your bills? Are you able to do your finances and do cal calculations? Are you accurate? Are you, are you getting help with any of these things? Can you go to work in a regular car? Are you driving yourself or using public transport? And after work, are you knackered or are you participating in things you like to do? Are you keeping up with your social connections? And do you have to have support to do any of these activities? Now, this is a, a longer conversation, but you might be able to do it with a bit of a pre-screen. So they thought about it ahead of time. Note that many third-party payers lump all of these things into activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living, or they'll lump it all together as global functioning. But these are some of the picky poos that come up on the forum. So it's good to ask them ahead of time. So things that you might do is for that tinnitus, you might need an ear, nose, throat screen. For a nausea and angustia, you want to have a dietitian review or, or a bit of a journal of what they're actually eating, or maybe their weight has gone up or down, try to capture that. You may be sending them for some tests if not already done, but a lot of things, things have already been done. So uh, chest x-ray, CT chest, pulmonary function tests. You may be able to uh, catch up with the cardiologist on what's been done, or if the patient is having vague chest pain, you may have to re uh, trace the steps of investigation listed here. Uh, again, that nutri nutritional profile, making sure they don't have something else like a fit test to make sure. The neuro exam, uh, it can be done almost on camera. I have people 
stand in front of me. Don't use your hands. Show me your hands while you get up out of your chair. Reach for the sky. Touch your toes. There's a lot you can do on camera. Single leg stance and having them walk. And if they can do all of that, I'm feeling pretty good about their ability for strength, but not necessarily an endurance check. Muscle pain and fatigue, uh, if in person you can do things like manual muscle testing, range of motion, but really whatever we do to them or have them do for us, we need to screen a couple of days later, how did that work? Did that, was there any rebound symptoms based on me asking you to do the time to up and go test or walk in my office or the timed walk of six minutes? Um, getting that delayed report back is really important to capture the full fatigue people. The brain fog people are a little hard, but sometimes you catch it just by a regular interview that they can't even give you their history. They're totally scattered and really unable to pull their story together. And you're into looking at medical records to fill it in. If you are adept and wish to do a, a MME or a MOCA, go ahead. But I usually do that basic ADL and IDL questions. And I ask really particular questions. How long does it take you to pay your bills? What's your method? Do you actually put it in the mail? Uh, that kind of thing. For mood, we all screen for this quite regularly. I, I'd say that the global assessment of function, just the two question or the nine question isn't picking these people up. And you may need to do a bit of a post-traumatic stress screen. Um, there is a lovely Harvard series on how to screen for post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to go back to my dad and his pile of charts waiting for him. Nowadays, it's a number of electronic medical record tasks that are looming and you look at it and it's going 100 or 200 and you start to freak out. So I think of that as that big pile of charts and how to approach it. In that early phase, it's absentee letters and later on some of these other systems. Now we really uh, can't cover all of these today, but I wanted to give you some principles that will help you, even if you're thrown a new one that doesn't fit our ones that we cover today, you'll be in good stead because you've already done your uh, screen, you've done your review of systems, and you've uh, maybe examined a few pieces of information, and you really know this patient, and you know them already, so you know that this has taken a, an impact for their general background function. Um, you need to be as objective and humble and clear as you can be. Uh, many third-party payers will have a clerk or a non-medical person doing the initial screen. So you're really wanting to be just straightforward and uh, using some non-medical language in your forms is actually helpful, mixed in with the medical language so that they can look things up and come up to date with you. Um, don't take the patient's side, uh, don't own the patient. Even though, even though you may have, uh, they may have been born and delivered in your practice, and, and as my dad would call them, they're mine. Um, you have to be careful to be as objective as possible because if you're if you're you know not, your report will will have less uh, credibility to it. Um, if you're at the stage where the tests will probably be negative, don't continually refer for unnecessary tests or programs that may not help. Say what you can say say what you can't say and say what nobody can say. Nobody knows this yet, the state of our current knowledge. Keep an EMR copy of the form. Uh, this is onerous when it's a booklet, but I make my clerk actually photocopy every side of the darn thing for when it's lost or when you have to do it again because they were refused. And if you have a copy of your old version, you can say, well, what, what, what wasn't clear about this? And it's quite helpful to have that EMR copy. And many of our patients are quite scattered a number of them will say, I lost my form or the dog ate it and it's really onerous to do it all again. So we will talk a little bit about one of my cases uh, and the absentee letter that came in. We'll have time to do the other first two of these, uh, this long list of things that we're all asked to do. My case is a 29 year old female. Uh, she is a city accountant for one of our cities in the interior. And despite doing everything perfectly well, for Christmas of 2020, she became unwell on Boxing Day. She literally had been doing all the precautions required and unfortunately was ahead of the vaccines coming out. She was swab positive. She had four trips to the emergency room through January with fevers, sweats, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, POTS-like symptoms initially thought to be more of her anxiety problems flaring up. She was hypervigilant, insomnia, fatigue and muscle pain, headaches and severe cognitive dysfunction. She was in short a mess. And the reason I got to see her, even though I'm not an upfront physician, is that the post COVID um, 
lectures I was starting to give in January made her family doctor, who's a friend of Liz Parfit, my ID specialist, say, why don't you send them to Jill and see what she can do? So I got to see this young lady by Zoom only. And that was February and February, March, we were barely getting started with things when um, she had this Manulife form come to my, my uh, desktop. And the Manulife form, um, you know, I, that was like, oh, great, here I am. I'm already involved. The family doctor is feeling un, un, uncertain on how to fill this thing out. And, and to be honest with you, so was I. So this is my honest to goodness form that I did on March the 12th. And that was only 75 days after her initial COVID positive, positive test. But it gives you an idea. Now, first of all, it's handwritten. I don't care. I like to make other people suffer with my handwriting and try to understand what I've said. And I also get it done fast. So I filled this out as follows. For please outline your patient's current symptoms and level of severity and frequency, I put long, persistent COVID-19 symptoms of severe fatigue, chest pain, muscle pain, POTS, defined, cognitive impairments, and headache. Please outline your current, the patient's current functional limitations and restrictions. Short tolerance for any activities, even basic ADLs, fatigue her. Cognitive blunting, instructed to refrain from major life and financial decisions, to pace and rest. Blood pressure, tachycardia episodes require medication support. For the next section, please provide details of your patient's current treatment plan. I was able to say POTS medications of fluorineph and propranolol. I was able to, um, I think someone needs to mute. Um, whoever's talking needs to mute. Thank you. Um, anxiety and mood support. She was already on bupropion, which I left her on, but I thought about maybe switching her over. Chronic fatigue strategies. I list them because again, this is a payer. They need to know what do you mean by that? And I said, pacing, scheduling, pacing rests, graduated activation. For cognitive strategies, I listed attention support, learning strategies, pacing and resting, and graded cognitive challenges. And I ended the form with the section of, if your patient's condition has not resolved, please outline details regarding your next steps for treatment and planning. Well, this was March of 2021, and I really was just flying by the seat of my pants. Um, ongoing follow-up with specialists in cardiology, internal medicine, and rehab medicine. Repeat COVID-19 testing for viral clearance. I don't know if I would actually put that on now. Biggest treatment known for this condition, which is novel and still incompletely understood, is time. Rest and recovery is necessary at this early stage. I suggested that we keep her in the home-based rehab program for at least one to two more months and graduate back to work in very slow prescribed fashion. Return to work might start at one quarter days increments depending on symptoms and recovery from each trial. So that's really gives the payer an understanding that I'm slowing them right down. This is now a temporary total disability for this patient and she qualifies for them. I also added some unsolicited reference, the one that I showed you, in fact, the January review article with its uh, website link so that if they're really curious why I'm talking about time, that article would uh, start them off. So that's my section on a uh, absentee letter. I'd like to now try to tackle in the time that we're having together, this wonderful quagmire of PWDBC. And this doctor's or nurse practitioner section can really uh, put a lot of people off. But in, in, when I was looking for some of those paperwork on my dad's desk, my, my dad um, who was doing his best uh, would leave that big pile there. And I was subbing in as the MOA of the office uh, by later high school or in between years at university, I actually functioned as the substitute uh, person up front. And I'd get the call from the patient saying, has he done my forms yet? Because I don't have any way to make money. I can't pay my rent. And I'd hear their stories and try to go in and put that form to the top of the pile and force his hand a little bit to do them. So this is me um, saying to you, yes, it's a challenging booklet to do, but it can be done with some of these tools in place. And it's not so bad once you get to know it. The qualification to be a person with disability in British Columbia is that you're a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, and a resident of BC 18 years of age or older. That your condition, mental or physical, will last for the next two years or more. 
and that there's significant restrictions in performing activities of daily living. This is not a form all about the ability of the patient not to do their own job. It's their ability to really cope in life. And then some of the patients will say, yes, I can do that. I get dressed in the morning. And you'll say, well, how long does it take you? If you ask them that, you'll find out that they're really struggling to do their ADLs. They're taking multiple times as long as a regular person. And remember that definition is limitations are longer than what is normal for a human being. So time matters. Uh, a number of um, patients may have a lot of assets and there is an income and asset, uh, asset test but it is fairly liberal now. They are allowed to have $200,000 in a, 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 a RDSP. They're allowed to have a car under uh, $10,000 for the lower mainland, under 15 for the north. They need a more reliable vehicle for the north. And there's a number of other additional supports and uh, basic needs covered by PWD, which really helps the patient, but it's not flush. They're not making a lot of money on it. Uh, every month, uh, making about 1244 with COVID extras, about 1400 a month right now. Now. So they're not living high off the hog, but there is a, an ability to stop gap their needs and get over their medical situation. The first section of this PWD booklet is actually filled out by the patient. And it's optional and some of the patients are overwhelmed by the look of it and they don't do the essay, which actually um, I think it's very important for that subjective impact of their condition to be documented somehow. So I usually get them to write it. If they have English as a second language, I sort of get my clerk to help them and get a little draft together. And they could do it on rough paper first and even have it typed in by my clerk if I'm not, if I know that they're not going to be able to do it. This is what that confronts the patient up front. Here's the booklet outside. Then they turn the page and this is the inside of their demographics. They started on that. And then there's this little box that says, I uh, agree that I'm not doing this next section, which is about two pages worth of essay. And then they sign it. And if they don't feel that they can do that, it can be a little overwhelming. Sometimes they've done it really well. And I read the essay because I want my section to reflect what they are suffering. The section two is the medical report section and a nurse or NP, NP or physician can be filling that out. Uh, it's not very long. It does require some succinct codes and short descriptors. It's not too bad for functional assessments once you've got that listed. But there are some things that would be helpful to know, key phrases that the, they're looking for. They want to know if it's severe, if it's going to last longer than two years, if it's posing significant restrictions in their activities of daily living, and if they're doing their activities of daily living, are they accomplishing them by the, the useful help of another person or a device? If any of those are yes, then the person is in the, in the category that could qualify for PWDBC. And the phrases I often will put in, these uh, symptoms that they're having are a result of severe and permanent and persistent impairments. The function is markedly restricted and a direct result of these impairments. And despite ongoing treatments, the impairments will not likely resolve within two years. They're chronic, pervasive, and severe. And the ministry and most government agencies seem to have a three times longer or three times slower rule or three times less productive. I don't know where three came up with. I don't know if it's got any scientific relevance, but it seems to be a, a sort of an a, a, um, implicit cutoff point. So this is the physician section. I do this to retinal image you to death. Oh, no, actually, what I'm doing is so you don't get scared. This Basically, this section is the codes, and this is their codes. These are not ISD 9 or 10. These are a more smooshed or uh, lumped set of codes for us to choose from. We write a very short essay, and then we're into some of the functional stuff. And some of the functional stuff, if I can um, hopefully zoom in on this for you, um, it's uh, can the person walk unaided on a flat surface and how far? So a number of the questions are quite helpful, but you may not have asked your functional inquiry well enough to answer them. So you just get your assistant to re-ask the patient what their actual tolerances are. And the final sections are things to do with functional activities of daily living. So this is uh, then a um, basic way of getting across uh, our section two done. And the, the tougher section is actually section three, but I'll, I'll just give you a couple of pointers on those codes. If you were doing uh, a dictation or being paid by MSPBC, the uh, ICD-9 code that I've been using is 078.89, which is any post-viral sequelae. And it seems to be a good catch-all uh, for the types of patients I've been seeing. Then 
for patients with POTS or cardiovascular or respiratory, we've got uh, cardiovascular other and respiratory other, so they don't have to have asthma, uh, emphysema, et cetera, uh, known lung disease. Digestive disorders, musculoskeletal pain, and other or chronic fatigue are ones that I've been finding helpful. But remember that a lot of the patients have mental and cognitive symptoms that are a little hard to quantify, and they would come under these mental health other, mood, anxiety, and neurologic disorders other. And those are all uh, codes that I would put in, uh, or all of them, depending on, on how much you want to fill out. Note that as you hit that functional section, the activities of daily living section, you can get out of filling it out if you are also doing the assessment part E. I tend to do that because of PTOT training. I think part E, I can get it done. And then the part two, section one and section two jive very well. And if I'm not doing part three and another assessor has done part three, I like to take a look at it ahead of me doing my section E of the section two because I want them to jive quite nicely. So the assessor has this layering of forms to do. And again, it's a little bit scary with the um, uh, sort of um, detail. But again, if you think of it as independent, periodic assistance or continuous assistance using a device or added time on all of these functional aspects of the patient, you can kind of get through this quite well. And each of them have that same sort of categorization. So dressing, independent, added time, functional assistance, or adapted and uh, again, cooking and so on. So this is a fairly comprehensive, reminding ourselves that this is actually designed for anybody. It's designed for cognitive, brain, stroke, amputees, anybody who would qualify for PWD. So in all honesty, it's a very good form because it captures, I can make most of my patients fit this form. But for the cognitive impairment people, I have to fill it out carefully. I'd like to take a bit about the cognitive impairment with the example of the uh, disability tax credit. And I'd like to also credit Dr. Rick Arsenault who gave me uh, access to his slides and thoughts on this so that I was able to maybe improve my presentation for this section for you. Uh, the disability tax credit comes into play when uh, you are able to say the symptoms will last 12 months. And these are very common forms. This is the place to uh, be able to download your own blank version, unlike the PWD booklet, which is given to the patient from the Ministry of Social Services that uh, they have to carry that booklet. And it's not a very nice form because you have to take it apart to copy it and so on. The ta tax credit is only eight pages. So you think, oh, I'm out of the woods, only eight pages, I can do this in my sleep. When in fact, it's a little bit ch more challenging in some ways, because they lump things together. So a person has to be markedly restricted in at least one basic activity of daily living or two or more of the basic activities of daily living combined at a slightly less, lesser level. And the impairment has to be at least 12 months continuous and present 90% of the time. So it's a little bit challenging for the fluctuating patients. You have to be careful to capture their worst day. These are the sections that they have, vision, hearing, eliminating bowel and bladder, dressing, speaking, walking, feeding, and mental functions. So again, a bit of a lumping and, and collation of areas that I might split off. And when considering your patient's limitation, they, they capture it. They said, does not have an impairment that in that particular category, just leave it blank. If your patient has experiences limitations in more than one category, they may be eligible for this thing called a cumulative effect of significant limitations. So basically what I'm finding is of my, for my post-COVID patients, uh, vision and hearing is often not affected. They are often continent and fully functional in that department and they're feeding themselves. So I'm looking at other ADLs of dressing, making sure that they're not actually taking a long time to do that or leaving themselves in pajamas for three weeks. Uh, I'm asking them about their ability to communicate, not just speaking. I'm actually making them uh, think they're, how long does it take you to think what you want to say. So I'm putting a bit of cognition in the speaking category. And then the more motor tasks of walking and cognitive tasks for everyday life, those are where our patients are very affected. So for limitations in speaking, it may not apply to everybody, but in that interview and even a Zoom call, if they're taking forever to give you a history and physical, you've got that. 
and uh, it's, it, it has difficulty, but and takes an inordinate amount of time is the other thing, at least three times keeps coming up in all their literature. Um, for dressing, the same idea. I asked them specifically, how long does it take you to dress? They, oh, I don't know, I never time myself. I said, please time yourself and call me back. The challenge is the invisible disabilities. It's easy when someone has a very obvious limitation or an amputation or a stroke, but the, the speech, walking and mental functions area are really what patterns out for our patients with uh, long COVID. And a bigger thing that we have to kind of be mindful of is that limitation due to post-exertional malaise, fatigue or symptom amplification. And the lag time for that to happen is 12 to 48 hours. I usually say like one to two days. Uh, sometimes what you did on Monday will make you feel crummy on Wednesday. So I have to get that history out of them. And they have to be limited to do things. They can do things and they don't get a rebound, but they're doing everything at a, such a slow and paced restful way that it's very hard to be competitively employable with that. And if they do anything uh, that reduces their tolerance, they will crash and they will call it a crash. If you've prescribed uh, this as a risk of harm and we'd like you to reduce to prevent post-exertional malaise, then you've actually imposed the limitation on them justifiably, but they have to quantify that as now being a limitation compared to normal humans doing that activity. And if they have a restriction in their workplace or in their daily life or driving and so on, because they've been told do no harm, this pacing then further uh, handicaps them basically. And we have to meet that criteria and document it well. And mental functions for everyday life, it, it captures a lot of initiation, um, uh, planning, uh, doing the plan, following through, actually accomplishing. It's very challenging to quantify these things. I'd like to return to my 29 year old female city accountant who is improved by all those things that we did for her, but she is still uh, better for her postural hypotension and general fatigue, but still quite limited. She does some of the walking um, prescriptively short, and I asked her to quantify that. And she can went to a little local school and did a lap of 400 meters and was able to say, it takes me 10 minutes to do one lap. And I was able to find out that that had been a, something she'd work up to doing and she, it didn't, she didn't rebound with that. She also described mental fatigue at 30 minutes, but by 30 minutes, she was already making mistakes to know that she was fatigued. So for her accounting task, she really was still quite disabled. And because she's so smart and aware of her limitations, she was depressed and anxious and, and really quite worried about her future. Um, she had socially withdrawn quite a bit. She had asked for so much help from her boyfriend, uh, was going to be a fiance, but that all kind of got put on hold. And she actually admitted that she'd gone home to mom several times because of the stress within the home. I had uh, uh, Rick provide this wonderful slide on the six minute walk test. And I don't make people do six minutes walk, walk tests if their histories are really clear, but for you to really understand what we're comparing people to, what is normal for a human being is a 10th percentile, 20th, 5th percentile, 50th percentile, or um, 75th percentile performance level. So what is the 50th performance level for a healthy male, 40 years old? Uh, he could go for six minutes, 650 meters. The 40-year-old 50th percentile female, 625 meters. There's the resource. For patients with post-exertional malaise, which has been studied somewhat, average age 38, for the 75th percentile, they can do 312 meters. So my patient at 400 meters in 10 minutes, uh, I could do a six minute and say that she didn't get all the way to around. So she in three, in, in, in uh, six minutes, she probably made it to, um, to 300 meters. She's, she's right in this category of post-exertional and limiting herself. So how to fill out that form is that you are a medical doctor and that you are saying the following. PASC uh, with features of myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, and with features of postural orthostatic hypertension. She still had that. And does the patient take medication? No, the patient does not require an assistive device such as a cane or walker. However, a therapeutic approach to coping with limitation in walking is used. Paced activation, maintaining a minimum activation, but prescribing limits to avoid exacerbation of post-exertional pain and fatigue. So that's how I felt that out. Um, she walks so slowly, 
it's one third as fast as normal, must stop and rest frequently, and is restricted in walking up or down stairs or inclines. She frequently experiences pain, stiffness, fatigue, and reduced balance, shortness of breath, and dizziness. She is uh, walk if she walks for more than 10 to 20 minutes, she will have uh, post-exertional malaise, which can last one to two days or more. And the prescribed medications to reduce reduce symptoms is to walk 10 minutes, then rest for 10 minutes, walk another 10 minutes. Symptoms are severe, frequent, persistent for the foreseeable future. So that's uh, being very clear to them about their terminology. For the mental function area, they define adaptive functioning and memory for you. Uh, we also have our own levels of definition of that, but, the, but using their terms helps. They, again, the diagnosis is PASC. She has reduced attention, memory, calculation, accuracy, and prompt dependent for initiation and follow through for basic ADL. Features of myalgic encephalopathy, features of postural orthostatic. And when I get to the section on uh, devices, uh, to help her, memory aids or journals, day miners, lists, alarms, prompts from her caregivers, support the living arrangement with boyfriend and family, phone spot checks by family if left home alone, cognitive behavioral strategies of dividing tasks, scheduling, paced activities, scheduled rest, energy conservation techniques for task simplification, and some tasks delegated to family. And to seal the deal, provide additional details and uh, is the patient be getting support. It's usually the support by family that we fill out for these category three people. Family will play tag team to support her if she is at home for long hours. Phone calls to check to prompt her back on task if required. While this is improving, the family is not confident in her safety if she were to live on her own. So that section helps uh, for the adaptive functioning. We, we are able to say that she can perform, not perform necessary daily activities and she's not going out into the community. It's truly a moderate, almost moderate to severe, and she has trouble remembering material and the import, that is of importance or interest to the patient. So their form can be done with these parameters. The final one, I think, is this uh, additional information for judgment, problem solving, and goal setting. And I described her as having difficulty in attention, focusing, concentrating, memorizing, and processing information. Tolerance to cognitive tasks begins to fail at 30 minutes with failure to recall new learned information. Persevering with cognitive tasks beyond tolerance office, often results in post-exertional malaise, which can last one to two days after the activity. Needs to read or hear the same information several times requires longer or is unable to resolve a problem without assistance, difficulty with organizing and prioritizing, easily overwhelmed, self-isolates and avoids interactions with people due to not being able to keep up to social cognitive demands, struggles with emotional regulation and suffers severe anxiety and depression, prescribed medications for cognitive tasks is 10, uh, a prescribed restriction for cognitive tasks is 10 minutes, then rest for 10 minutes gives you an idea. And I always backdate to the year of onset of symptoms because it started December 26, 2020, in case there is a backdating or a discrepancy for people to understand the condition and when it truly started. And the cumulative effects page is that she had trouble with her speaking, with her walking, with her mental functions. I anticipate them to be going on for at least uh, the 12 months or 24 months in this case. And uh, this patient um, will likely qualify for this. I've put together some useful links for you um, that are basically from the descriptions today, as well as the talk that I gave before. I'd like to congratulate you for, uh, if you're still with me, <laughs> for, for paying attention all this time. And I was hoping to spend the remainder of our time for examples, cases, cases and problems that you've had in form filling that uh, both Dr. Arsenault, myself, and other members of the team might be able to assist you with. Hi, Jill. Grant Del Bijo here. Hi, Grant. Hey. Um, so, you know, while I'm sure it's not something we do in any way routine, but if there was somebody where there was contention as far as their disability, 
Uh, is there any role in, uh, or any experience around nerve conduction studies that sort of testing muscles, uh, nerves? Um, for those that have post ICU itis, the uh, post um, uh, intensive care syndrome of neuropathy and myopathy, they do map out on EMG testing. But to be honest with you, those are the rare people. Those have been on a ventilator for three weeks and they've had the intensive care, uh, even without the COVID being in, in, in an ICU for that long, we have nutritional reasons or multiple medications like uh, antifungals and antibiotics will cause peripheral neuropathy in a patient who's uh, that intensively ill. And nutritionally, we get in there with uh, central uh, nutrition, but it, it's never as good as through the gut. So there's, these patients are intensely ill and, and medically very unwell. So they're kind of worth doing and hopefully have been recognized up front and had their baseline EMGs done along the way. If not, picking them up late would be unusual. Uh, you don't get the pattern of foot drop or wrist drop or a mononeuropathy type of picture with the COVID so far. Um, it's more of the systemic illness that they're suffering. And in fact, the muscle pain or fatigue uh, they're normal. You can do EMGs on them. You can do uh, muscle check and, uh, and, and an EMG of the muscle and nerve conduction, and they're perfectly normal. It's a feeling thing. They, they have a tolerance that's reduced, and it's probably a central sensitization spectrum disorder where we're dealing with the cognitive fog as well as pain, as well as generalized pain, and as well as the uh, post-exertional fatigue and malaise. That's really Rick's game at the Children's and Women's Hospital. Maybe you want to dive in with a comment to, to grant, Rick? No, I think you covered it wonderfully. Uh, unfortunately, most of these patients have completely normal testing. A small number, uh, sorry, a large number of patients with fibromyalgia will also have a small fiber neuropathy, but that's not picked up by EMG or nerve conduction studies. And we rarely, in fact, I've never done a, a palm biopsy to prove uh, small fiber neuropathy. Many of these patients want a test to be positive. And if the test is positive, they are very sick. <laughs> so, so we actually say to them, well, you've got a lot of very, very significant symptoms. Now we have to, to manage the symptoms. So you go into chronic disease management mode with this uh, condition. And then uh, just uh, as far as neural imaging, is there any role in these chronic patients in terms of things? I suppose obviously if they had some focal sign, you're gonna do a CT at their head and that sort of thing, but I'm assuming generally not. But. Generally not in my opinion. Um, the, MR, the negative MRI doesn't really help you. An MRI takes us down to the uh, cellular level of about, uh, half a millimeter, a quarter of a millimeter. Um, so CT is about five millimeters and we're really dealing with a electronic level disorder. So it's not gonna show up on an imaging. And as I think Rick did the wonderful analogy of, it's a problem with your software, not your hardware. The hardware is there, it's working fine. And unless they've had a, a hypercoagulable state and they've actually had a stroke from the COVID, which is a thing, there is a, a small vessel vasculitis and small vessel um, disorder that will show up on MRI with uh, enhanced imaging. Uh, it's still back at the ranch as to what to do about that. You're gonna, again, symptomatically manage them. You're gonna confirm that. Um, it might make uh, a form fill out better, but it's really from a management perspective, it's not a focal stroke like others and you're still dealing with a more diffuse cognitive impairment. Thank you. Thanks for asking so many questions. He's a, a family doctor here in Camlets and it, he's not a plant. I didn't know he was going to ask those questions. Hi, um, I just, at the start, I had messaged, um, my name is Jackie. I am an, not a plant as well. I am a private OT in Camlets. Um, I, <laughs> I work Yay, with, Camlips. <laughs> Yay, Camlips. um, I work with, uh, clients that actually have never been in hospital, um, that have been seen by WorkSafe BC. 
um, and I am providing rehab for them. Um, I know that they are beginning to recognize it. There isn't really, I know there was a concern about push to employment and currently with the functional limitations that these clients are experiencing at home, that's not even something that is on the people that I've been working with with WorkSafe on their radar for that. So I hope that's helpful. Um, the functional deficits at home for the clientele that I've been working with is so significant. Um, one thing I, as a as a OTPT combined trained person, this is wonderful to have uh, the cognitive OT uh, coverage. The challenge for most of my family physician colleagues and me is getting things paid for. So getting that uh, form filled so that the manual life or greatless life or some life would actually pay for uh, occupational therapy time. And I did get this on a stroke patient. And for some reason, they said yes to that. But they're, they're having a bit of trouble with cognitive uh, patients from, from, from COVID-19. But I think because of the, I'm calling it an echodemic, there's boom, bust, echo. And I figured the, 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 the uh, reality of post-acute COVID is that we're kind of following in lockstep with whatever uh, waves have gone through ahead of us. I think that will uh, be safety in numbers, to, so to speak. Uh, as someone told me, they said the best thing, I think it might have even been Rick, who said the best thing that ever happened to chronic fatigue syndrome was COVID. Because now people are paying attention and putting some money into chronic fatigue symptoms and how do you manage them the best. So um, it's not uh, a happy circumstance, but at least I think there's safety in numbers and there will be some precedential cases that help our patients as they're going through. Thank you for speaking up. Has anybody else had a case that was refused and you didn't know why? You're all perfect. One thing I, I'd love to have you um, glean from the talk is the detail that they ask on these forms is not the detail that we would customarily ask in our history and physical. And I have accomplished a lot of this by upping the demands on the patient or their caregivers supporting the patient to fill out a screening form for me that will give me the data elements that I need for later. So my initial intake form is pretty awful, uh, but at least then I know that they can fill out a form. English is their second language. They've had to fill it out with their you know, uh, uh, son or daughter helping. I, I, I get a real sense of a patient's coping strategies if they can't fill out my form at all okay, we got, we got issues and we've got to really drill it down to figure out how to support them, even to fill out my screening form to see me. And you guys can do the same thing. You just pick, pick pieces off of each of these forms that you're asked, put them into your review of systems section. If there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank Jill. That was a great presentation. I wanna remind everybody that if you need UBC CPD accreditation, make sure that you put your name, first name, last name, and email in the chat. You will receive a post survey form uh, after the session. Please take a couple minutes to fill that out. The next session is on Tuesday, December 14th, again from 12 to one. And the topic is post-COVID-19, a mental health perspective. And Dr. Grant Miller from St. Paul's Hospital will be presenting. Uh, please stay tuned for registration. Have a great day, everybody.